of the book of James. So if you want to open up your Bibles, I just read chapter 1. We're going to come back and, and reread. Uh, Suzanne, could you turn, tune the mic down just a, just a smidget on mine? I got a little bit echoed. It's amazing how audio changes with temperature, bodies, different effects. Okay, that's, that's good enough. <laughs> if it didn't, it sounds better to me. <laughs> so as we've gone through the last week and the first part of this marvelous book that's written by James, a brother of Jesus, is one of what I, I just heard taught growing up and as well as I look at this book, a book of maturing, a, a way of helping us look at some very simplistic views of our salvation and how that we can build ourselves up in order to overcome a lot of the challenges we have. One of the greatest ones that we have has to do with dealing with perseverance during trials. When we have different problems that come at us, Christians, you know, we're not bulletproof. We're going to continue to suffer and deal with them. And he talks about how that we need to mature through that and understand that through that ability to endure with our faith being strong, Pray for wisdom to help us to have the ability to make the proper decisions as we go through this. Because that is something that we are always kind of, you know, struggling with is we have this book knowledge and then we know what it's saying, but then when it happens, are we able to actually put that into application? Is it something that's readily available to our memory so that as we face something, the memory automatically brings it in and it helps to calm us, settle us, or help us to make the proper decisions. But he says, ask with faith. You have to have the faith, the knowledge, and not believe that you can go back and forth. I love the way as well in this first chapter, he kind of equalizes the idea that a person who is, is rich, you know, and those who that are lowly, because we have all classes of people that are in the church. We have people who are wealthy. We have people that are poor. We have all sorts of whether in blessed in different conditions. Physical health, not so much physical health. But to look at the positions you're in and understand we're all equal because we're all going to die. We're all like the grass. We're like something in nature that's just coming now and tomorrow it will be gone. And then also then he talks about how to understand the idea that um, where does sin come from? Because when we're in problems and temptations and all these stressful events, we sometimes look and wonder, well, what did I do wrong? What was it? Is God doing this to me? Is my sin causing me to have this difficult time? And that's what He wants us to understand. Now, the Holy Spirit speaking to us, so this is coming from Jesus through the Holy Spirit through the Apostle James and helping us to understand that God doesn't operate that way. God doesn't take bad things in the world and use it somehow to test you, to see if you're worthy of it. You've already demonstrated that, one, we're not worthy. But we are worthy if we have accepted Christ, we have become a Christian, and that makes us worthy. And He does not use those things like the world may use against us. So understand that. And Well, blessed is the man who remains steadfast under trial. Because we have a crown that is laid up for us. A crown of life, He says. So, it is hard to put the reality to our faith when we're facing struggles. And, and I know that. I, I know that in my own personal life as well. Now the next part, the next lesson is, now we, we talk about the trials and how to deal with those and how to move through them, how to understand them, and then the great blessedness that we're gaining from handling those. But now, you, you've got to do more than just say, oh, great, that's that faith again. It's just words. He says, no, don't just be somebody who listens. Be a doer. And we know there's a lot of people like that in life on the many aspects. They talk a great game, you know. A lot of people that boast about, I'm able to go hunting and bring down, or I'm able to shoot basketball, or I'm able... And they, they talk it, they, they, they may even have the knowledge, but they don't really do it. They don't put it into action. And I think that's one of the most exhausting things when you run across people who talk, 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 but they don't walk it. They don't live it. and They don't put it in their lives. And so, we may face trials. We understand it. We persevere. We do it based on faith. We ask for our Father. We know where the sins are coming from. They're not coming from Him. But, and we go to church and we listen to these words of wisdom, but then you've got to take it further. You've got to take it further. You've got to go to the next step. And so, back over in verse 19, we're still in chapter 1, we begin there. We're going to read one. 21. Know this, my beloved brothers, 
Let every person be quick to hear, slow to speak, slow to anger. For the anger of man does not produce the righteousness of God. Therefore put away all filthiness and rampant wickedness, and receive with meekness the implanted word, which is able to save your soul. Be quick to hear. You know, that, you know, that sounds real easy. But a, but a lot of time, we're just talking after church this afternoon about somebody that was a Christian that it, the, he had this completely backwards. It was always, you know, quick to speak and very slow to listen. Are you listening to me? And this is so disrespectful when you talk about engaging with people who you may not completely agree with. But if you are always quick to speak and quick to anger, you're going to be alone. You're, going to, you're not going to have the friends you think you have. So this is something that's not just spiritual or Christian. This is something that in a functioning society today, in a family, if you're going to have good communications, you need to be the better listener than the, be, the one who can speak better. Listen. And, and I learned that lesson the hard way because I would assume that somebody is going to say something and so I'm quick to go ahead and want to give, give a response. And every time I do that, all of a sudden it seems like the person goes, no, that's not what I was going to say. Oh, if I would have just been quick to hear and slow to respond. You've had people do that to you? Somebody that, you know, maybe it's, whether it's just a friend, sometimes not controversial, that they will just kind of fill in the words for you, thinking that they know they're quick to want to speak. They're not quick to listen. And so I say, slow down. We just have to slow down. I think the younger children and adults, you see that in them, and hopefully as you grow, but as a Christian, spiritually, this is a sign of maturity. And that's how you can determine when you look at somebody who's spiritually growing in God's Word is that they slow down. You know, they're much quicker to listen and hear what's going on. In Colossians 3.8, the Apostle Paul tells us, put away this stuff. You know, this is an aspect of it that we need to get rid of. He says, but now you must put away all, all, um, all away anger, wrath, malice, slander, obscene talk from your mouth. The same people who are quick to speak and they don't listen, a lot of times they're slanderous. That means you're speaking against something without knowledge. You're using inadequate information and you're slanderous when you talk about somebody. And if you're a a really good listener, you're going to have better information to respond to people or to talk about a situation. You're a much more informed person. So put away these things, he says, and get them out of our mouth. And so, okay, Quick to listen, slow to speak. When you slow down before you speak, it gives you time to think about what you're going to say. And that's another issue is a lot of times people don't slow down and think through what they're fixing to say. I used to tell one of my sons, oh my, 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 that, that kid, he would just shoot it out. Whatever he thought. Blah, 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 blah. You know, just, just say it. Well, that's what I'm thinking. And I've, and I've seen excuses given for Christians who are really raw with that. They will just say something. Well, you know, he's just kind of rough around the edges. Well, he's just kind of gruffy. You know, that's what, well, then don't talk. Honestly, because this is, this is what he's saying is slow down. Think about it. Think about what you're saying. Because you see, the words that come out of your mouth mean something to somebody else in a way that you may not be able to predict. You may not, you may think you're knowing what you're saying, but because you're just shooting off and not comprehending. And the other thing is, you can't bring those words back. You can only apologize so much. Oh, I'm sorry, I just kind of shot off at the mouth. Oh, I'm sorry, I just kind of shot off at the mouth. And eventually people are like, I don't want to be around them. So we put those things away. How do what do we compensate, he says? Is to accept the implanted Word. Going all the way back again about the faith and how we listen to God's Word and we implant that humbly, embed it, make it a part of the fiber of who we are so that we can rapidly access it, that it's instinctive. You know, that, that's what we do when we train people like 
pilots in emergency situations, firefighters in emergency situations, and paramedics, and you know, army soldiers you know, that are in critical, that, that they're so well trained in, by word, reading and studying, that when the situation hits, they just react. I'll never forget, I went to Army Combat Medic School, and when I came back, me and my buddy, we, we had no experience at all. We're sitting out at a firing range, and I thought, I looked over at my buddy Kenny, I go, what are we going to do if something actually happens? Neither one of us have any experience. We have no idea what to do. What are you going to do? You know what happened? A round blew up in a tank. And we were sitting there, and I had the most fearful nightmare in an instant. My life passed in front of me. But you know what the next thing happened? My training kicked in. By the time we were done, I triaged, went through and everything, and we were done, I sat there and went, oh. I looked over at Kenny and I said, Kenny, it worked. I think that's our faith. We study it, we study it, and we know it, we know it. But then we wonder, what's going to happen when it really hits it? When, when something really happens to me? Am I going to be able to do it? Well, that's what will make the difference. Have you implanted the Word of God in you to the point where when it comes time, it not even thought about. You just respond. And if it's not, then the Word's not really implanted well enough. So I thought that was pretty amazing. Because then as we implant the Word, the other beautiful thing is it helps us to be faster to listen to somebody. It helps us to be slower in our speaking. And it really changes our perspective about how much you can anger me. Because I become a lot more long suffering with this implanted word from God. Verse 22 and 25, continuing on the idea of being a doer, not a listener. But doers of the word, and not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. For if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like a man who looks intently at his natural face in a mirror. For he looks at himself and he goes away and at once forgets. He was like, but the one who looks into the perfect law, the law of liberty, and preserves, being no hearer who forgets, but a doer who acts, he will be blessed in his doing. So just sitting there listening to somebody talk about God's word, just, you know, and then expecting that somehow it's just going to happen, it's not. He said, the only way that we will be blessed by the result of our knowledge is by acting upon it. And he says it's this idea that. Now, I, I thought of Romans chapter 2, verses 13 through 16. He says, talking about the idea of law. When somebody considers themselves righteous during this time that Paul is writing this, there were two ways you could consider yourself as being righteous, religious. One of them was that you were a Hebrew, or a convert, a proselyte to Judaism. You're circumcised, you follow the Mosaic law, and you were, you were considered a religious person. The other way was you know, that you were faithful to your pagan religion, whatever it may be, that you followed through with all those things, you went through all those acts. Now to the Jew, they looked out at everybody outside of you know, Mosaic law and figured, well, you're all condemned. Ha, huh, yeah. You guys, God's going to judge you. We know this God. This God, unless you're a Jew and you're doing the Mosaic Law, you guys are all in trouble. But look what he says here. He's talking about the, the same principle of being somebody who says they listen to the law. They would go listen to the priest, but they didn't do it. And that's what he says. He's showing them. He says, For it is not the hearers of the law who are righteous before God, but the doers of the law who will be justified. For when the Gentiles who do not have the law, by nature do what the law requires. They have a law to themselves, even though they do not have the law. They show that the work of the law is written on their heart, while their conscience also bears witness, and their conflicting thoughts accuse or even excuse them on that day when, according to my gospel, God judges the secrets of men by Christ Jesus. Now, I'm not saying that a person is going to be saved without ever obeying anything God says, but what he's trying to bring up, the point is, is that here they had the law of Moses and they should have been teachers of righteousness, but yet they weren't. They were worse off than those who did not have a covenant relationship through Moses, but yet they were doing the very things, the universal moral code, 
naturally. And they were doing it. They were doing it. They weren't just talking about it. They were very moral good people. And so that, that is what we find today sometimes, is people who claim to be Christians, we're religious, we go to church, we do certain things, but when it comes down to actually executing upon our faith and actually carrying out duties, we see some fall short. And he says that is a lack of maturity. That's a lack of maturity. I love the idea of somebody that can look in a mirror and somehow walk away and just forget what their face looks like. You know what we call that today? Dementia. Dementia. When, so, when somebody can look in a mirror, and I, it frightens me to have the idea that I could ever have dementia, but, you know, and, but there, are, there are people who have that type of such short memory that they just completely forget. You could tell them something one moment, they could sit and nod, they could restate it to you, and then turn around and walk away, and then you ask them something about it, and they go, we never even talked about that. And if you know somebody and had somebody, it, it's heartbreaking to watch them go through that. How do you think God feels? <laughs> He's got a lot of children with Christian dementia, you know, that, that seems to hear the Word of God all the time. Just there and nods and says, yeah, and can restate it. But then as soon as they walk out of the building and they've got their Bibles, they've forgotten it. So James says it's like the guy who looks in a mirror and sees what his face looks like, turns around and walks away. There's something wrong about that. Another description I thought of is a word that we get thrown on a lot as Christians. It's called a hypocrite. Somebody who talks it, the Jews, there was a lot of hypocrites that Jesus had to deal with. You know, it's somebody who claims or pretends to be something. Acting is actually one of those words. It also hypocrite, you know, one who acts or puts on something that they're really not. And that's what somebody who hears the word, who says they're religious, yet then they're not really doing it. But he says, the one who looks into the perfect law. And one of the things I didn't mention, but looking back at that context in chapter 2, when he's talking about law, he was talking about very specifically Mosaic law to the Jewish Christian that they were familiar with, and then saying that the Gentiles were without law, without Mosaic law. They were still held accountable to a law. I wanted to clarify that. I kind of ran over that thought. Because now, back over here in James, when he talks about the idea of looking into this perfect law, why is it perfect? You ever thought about that? Why is all of a sudden this perfect? Because of the blood of Christ. It was the perfect. The old law and everything was a shadow of the thing that was really to be in place that God had planned for. And so he says, this is the perfect law. It's perfect. And it sets you free. If you look at the way that the Mosaic law was prescribed for people to follow, it was very burdensome. And it was still something that they couldn't really accomplish. So he says that, you look into that perfect law. And he says, this is how you can preserve. And that is one who is a doer. They listen, they remember because of that perfect law and understanding the greatness of it, and they put it into action. That's the one that's blessed. So there's a lot of things about James so far in this book that he's bringing up, the idea that you, know, you want to accomplish, this is what you accomplish, and you, you receive blessings from that. You receive blessings from these things. So there's the motivation that we understand. So let's look at verses 26 and 27. If anyone thinks he's religious and does not bridle his tongue but deceives his heart, this person's religion is worthless. Religion that is pure and undefiled before God, the Father, is this. Visit, to visit the orphans and the widows in their affliction and to keep oneself sustained from the world. There you go. That's all you got to do. You just go, you know, visit orphans, take care of widows, and I'm in heaven. I know. That's, sometimes, you know, you think of that. Let's go back to the context, you know, when we think about it. So if somebody thinks they're religious, what, are you, what, what, what does that describe? That describes somebody externally that is following through the procedures or dedication and stating it. Somebody who shows that they're religious. It doesn't mean they're saved. It doesn't mean they're spiritual. You know, I have, you know, you know people that when it comes to football, it's, they're religious to it. You know, they have this religion, this faithfulness towards something. So you can be religious, but not spiritual. You can have the external 
trappings of what we call, and that's the battle that Jesus had between the Pharisees and people of that day was the idea that they claimed, and they were. They went to the temple, they went through the motions, they did all that, and they were very religious. And that's what they thought. But he says, bridling the tongue is connected here. There's something about the, the tongue, and he's going to move to it a little more in chapter 3, but look at this idea. If somebody thinks he's religious and can't control your mouth, you're deceiving yourself. And your religion is worthless. If you cannot control your mouth, your religion is worthless. Think about that for a moment. It doesn't matter how often you go to church. It doesn't matter how many good things you do. How many wonderful prayers you pray. If you can't control your mouth, your religion is worthless. That's pretty sharp, isn't it? Should that not cause us to sit back and think about the way we talk to others? That we talk with one another? I think it should scare us that when we cannot slow down and speak with love and gentleness to one another, then how are we talking to the world? How does the world see us? You see, that, that's what the world sees is right the opposite of everything that I'm talking about here. The, that, there, it's all over out there. It should not be so with us. So he said, religion that is pure and undefiled before God, the Father, is this. He's just using two points here. Because we know there's a lot more. But these are two examples, he says, that if you want to see somebody that is truly, ha truly has a good religious life, you will see it in the way they do, for example, visiting orphans and taking care of people. You will see it, in other words, what? In their actions. In their actions. And so he uses these two. And so he says in that, and to keep yourself unstained. Keeping yourself from the other sins. But the other thing, really remember the thread we're working on here is the idea of not just listening, but taking things into action. I think going back to the Old Testament, one of the prophets really brings this home in Micah. In Micah chapter 6, verses 7 and 8, he says, talking, he's talking to the, the Jews who are thinking that they're very religious, they're going through all the motions and all that, but God has become sickened with it because they're not really spiritual. They're religious, but they're not spiritual. And God is appalled at their actions. And so this is a part of a conversation he has with them. He says, will the Lord be pleased with a thousand of rams, with ten thousand of rivers of oil? Shall I give my firstborn for my transgression, the fruit of my body for the sin of the soul? He has told you, O oh man, what is good, and what does the Lord require of you but to do justice and to love kindness and to walk humbly with your God? A rhetorical question. But you see, somebody who is following the religious emotions and actions it's not spiritually following and loving God. They miss that because the very first part when he says there, he says, you think the Lord is going to be pleased with thousands of rams? Yeah! The thousands of rams, man, that's a lot. That's amazing sacrifice. Look what you're showing to God. Not just one, but you're bringing a thousand of them. But he said, now look inside yourself. That's where the corruption's at. You're doing it as an external act. You're not doing it with actions from the heart. What he wants from us it's simply, he says, be justice, be just, love kindness, which works in conjunction with our mouth, right? With the words, and do that. So that's the part of James we're going to cover today, the lesson of being somebody who's not just you know, hearing the word, but we're actually taking it and making it a part of our faith. That's the only way that you will be blessed. It's the only way that you'll be able to overcome the world. It's the only way that we can honestly reach out and evangelize the lost in this suffering world that we see around us with so much hate and anger, is to not just come and listen to His Word, but take those words, make them a part of who we are, and then demonstrate it. Do it. People will see us, and they will want to know, why are you so unique? What's different about that person? Look at the kindness. Look at the things they're doing for us, and how kind their words are, how loving they are, in spite of what's happening to them around around them and how they're able to handle all the
problems in their lives, how they persevere every time through things, how they're so humble before all men. Is there somebody here this evening that we can help you in your relationship with him? If you're online and you'd like to know more about salvation, hope that you'd reach out. Let us have an opportunity to study with you. Drop a comment. We'll respond to it. Shoot us an email. We hope that you would investigate us more so that we could let you know about what we believe and how we are simply just people trying to help others get to heaven. If there's anything else we can do to help you in your relationship, let us know while we stand and we sing the invitation song.